everybody, Dean Olmschneider. And Zach Israel. Thanks for joining us on... Into, Into the, the overhead. overhead. Unfortunately, Josh is not with us again. He is busy, um, I don't know, moving or... Life things. More fun things like fun diving. Who knows? I, I have no idea. idea. Yeah, right. Whatever. Uh, anyhow, um, Zach and I have been talking. You guys might remember him. He is the diver that um, we did an episode on previously for diving with diabetes. And we figured it's probably about time we've come a long way from where we were. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, light years. Cool. So we figured we'd make another episode and discuss with you guys the things that we've implemented, the changes we've made, and so on and so forth. So there are some people that feel that diving with diabetes is bad. Some people feel that diving with diabetes is dangerous. Agencies, divers, instructors, whatever it may be, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Um, I am the type of person that feel that this guy, Zach, would probably dive anyway, whether he was properly trained or not, with or without diabetes, wouldn't matter because he got bit by the cave bug, wouldn't you say? Yeah. A little bit. I don't, I don't know about diving improperly trained, but I would definitely dive with diabetes. There you go, which is what you're doing. Yeah. So if you remember from last episode, um, we went over some things that we discovered and we're working on and all that stuff. If you haven't seen the previous episode, please go back to the channel at a previous date and watch that one first because it's kind of a precursor to this one. So and don't construe any of that as current advice or medical advice. This yeah. is. And, and please don't take anything that we talk about today as an okay for you with diabetes to go diving. Um, this is something that I have taken on um, because I, I, I'll be honest, I'm an instructor that, that cares enough to take every step that I could possibly take to ensure that people go into a dive and come out of a dive safely. And this all started, just a quick recap, this all started with Zach in cavern class. When was that? About, just about a year ago, yes, right? a year ago on the dot. About a year ago. Um, took a cavern class. Cavern went kind of okay. Um, Zach had his first <clears throat> oh crap moment. <laughs> when, that was fun. <laughs> when his buddy gave him an out of gas and he took his regulator out of his mouth and donated it and then <clears throat> took a big breath without putting a reg in his mouth first. And he doesn't let me hear the end of it. Nope. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Listen, if I let you forget it, you might forget it, and then it won't stick for next time, right? It was a formative experience. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> but I also believe that people shouldn't get a full cave card um, until they've had their first oh crap moment. Um, and you had yours, so awesome. Um, but first day of intro, we went to dive in Twin Cave, <clears throat> and um, he had a low blood sugar episode. So I'll let Josh talk for a minute real quick. Josh. Oh, wow. You really miss him, don't I, you? I do. <laughs> my heart aches without my Josh. Well, uh, I'm going to let Zach talk for a minute about his experience in that moment. <clears throat> yeah, quick recap of uh, the low blood sugar event in Twin. So um, we were rounding about 700 feet in. Um, I think this was first attempt at full cave, maybe not intro, because we were farther than I think we would have gotten an intro. Um, yes, this was for first full cave attempt. Uh, Frank was with us. Yep. Okay. So first, I, I sit corrected. Yeah, sit corrected. Uh, this is our first full cave attempt, um, and we're roughly 700 into twin. Uh, and I started getting a really, really anxious feeling. Uh, and at first, it kind of dawned on me that okay, maybe you're just tired, uh, and maybe things aren't right. Let's thumb the dive for that reason. Um, and it quickly became apparent as my arms started shaking and I started to feel slight disorientation that, wow, okay, I'm having a low blood sugar event back here in this cave. Um, on the surface, that's not much of a, a big deal, but when we've got you know, probably a 15-ish minute swim out of the cave and we're in an overhead, um, that panic factor certainly came back and, uh, and bit me quickly. Um, and I think part of that was that we really didn't have procedures in place. I had a, a reactionary plan uh, that was only based around one thing, and that was that uh, I had a camelback of sugary liquid that was built into the spine of my K2. We bungeed it in, um, and that's all I had. Uh, and in that moment, that felt wholly insufficient um, for the situation I found myself in. Uh, you know, gladly that... If, 
we got out that day. Um, things went fine. You know, Dean came up, grabbed me, and asked, are, are we ending the dive? And threw a thumb back immediately and started working the problem on exit. Um, and I was able to make it out. But, you know, it shook me enough that uh, I sat out on the rest of the dives for that day. Big eye-opener for me, too. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Out. So from, from my standpoint, as an instructor, um, Zach shows up for class with assigned medical. Checked off he had diabetes, but doctor signed off that he was okay to dive. So I didn't know anything about low blood sugar and type 1 diabetes until that. And I'm going to be honest, that kind of spooked the heck out of me too, having a student hundreds of feet into a cave that was clearly having a little bit of trouble mentally processing. Would you say that's a, an accurate assumption? Yeah, an certainly. Accurate statement. So when we came out, we said, hey, <laughs> you're not getting a card, not only until your full cave skills are on point, but until we get all this under wrap. So we have spent the better part of the past year coming up with, I'm not gonna say endless because it's probably never gonna end, gonna be honest. Well, I'll be this for the rest of my life. We, we've come up with some procedures and steps and processes that will hopefully make it um, as smooth a dive that Zach could ever possibly hope for for every single dive he ever has for the rest of his life. So, why don't you tell him what we've come up with? Yeah, so um, step one begins on the surface uh, before we even get into extra layers of protection for in-water. Um, the first thing that Dean required of me was everybody that you dive with needs to understand this condition in its entirety and, and what may be asked of them and what can happen to you. Uh, because your mere presence on a dive adds another risk factor to an already risky activity. Huge risk factor, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one that we've mitigated sufficiently to the point that I would say, you know, the likelihood is of, of something catastrophic is in line with somebody having a heart attack in a cave. Um, but still, a risk factor um, because it's one of those things that you can attempt the control, but Murphy exists. Um, so the step one, um, what we initially attempted was I came back to class next day to finish out full cave. Um, and I ran a bunch of math and, and tried to do figuring out uh, actual down to the calorie replacement, how many sips of glucose I would need per hundred feet of cave, um, just to show Dean that I was really committed to solving this issue. Um, and that I was going to figure out how we were gonna make this plan safe. Um, we've moved away from that because that plan was slightly ridiculous. Um, we'll get into that later. Uh, but, learning experience instead yeah. of slightly ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, no, a lot of learning experience. Not ridiculous, but we, we replaced it with a, a far better system, um, we'll say. Uh, but at the same time, um, I drafted my first of the diabetes briefs. Um, so the diabetes brief began as a paragraph and then it turned to two and then it turned to five and then it turned to five pages. <laughs> um, so it is about a half hour brief now uh, that I will share with anybody that I'm about to execute a dive with. Um, people that dive with me frequently, like Dean, um, even he gets the full rundown every single time we go on a dive. Um, if it's just he and I and nobody else that's, that's new to the equation, we will still hit maybe not the full five uh, five pages, but the fine points, right? What may be required of him, signals. And pretty much just the changes that he's made since the last time I've heard it. Yeah. So it, it, is, it is an ever evolving uh, pre-dive brief yeah. that at several points during the brief, Zach asked, hey, is everybody still okay to continue? And anybody can bow out at any given point. So I had some feedback after we got towards uh, a let's say 95% complete version of, of what I have now. And um, somebody that dove with us, uh, just an intro level dive into, uh, I believe you were teaching an intro class or, or maybe a full class. Uh, we didn't go that far up the peanut line down in uh, Peacock Springs. Uh, but somebody that was on that dive um, anonymously told Dean, so I, I don't know, and I think it was great feedback, um, is that it's insufficient to give that brief in the water because once you're kitted up, then there's a certain impetus on everybody in the group to say yes. Um, so the diabetes brief is now given the condensed version well before I dive with anybody. When we make plans to dive, I 
lay out, hey, I'm type one diabetic. I want you to know that there are certain risk factors. Um, these are those things. You know, I have a much more extensive briefing that I can give to you either now, if you want to hear the whole thing now or on site. Um, but I want to know immediately, is, is this a disqualifier for you? If you don't want to dive with me, that is perfectly fine. Um, and that is one of my hard lines, Dean's hard lines, and it should be for anybody that's diabetic, is that if somebody is not comfortable with your condition, uh, especially when we're talking overhead diving, then you have to sit down and take the back seat. Um, and it's something that I'm comfortable to do. I will sit out if somebody doesn't want to dive with me. Just, just, to, just to clarify, when, when Zach says take the back seat, he doesn't mean that the other diver sits out to dive. If, if anybody on the team is not okay with Zach being on a dive, Zach is okay with stepping back from the team and doing a solo dive, which is entirely or, Zach's right. Or not diving if it's a place where solo diving is not allowed. Correct. Um, so that's uh, that just comes with the condition. In the same way that I accept the risks that come with the condition, I accept the realities of people may not want to dive with me. Uh, people may, even if they do want to dive with me as a friend, um, people may not want to have to leave me behind in the event of an emergency that that would delay their exit or and endanger uh, their life. Yeah, endanger their. Life. People may not want to be around in the you know god awful event that I were to pass underwater as a result of a diabetic event. Mm. People may not want to be around for that. Um, those are realities that are all laid out inside the diabetes brief. Um, Dean and I worked that alongside the management plan for months and months and months and months. Um, and as much as I would love to read it out in its entirety for this podcast, we'd be sitting here for an hour and a half. Um, Anybody that's watching, if you'd like to co get a copy of it, we are... We're happy to share it, right? Yeah, certainly. I mean, they're of- Knowledge uh, is power, so we're happy to share as much knowledge as we can. On Dan's Instagram account, um, Divers Alert Network, uh, they had a post regarding diabetes and diving, uh, and they had a, a hard exclusion, no overhead diving for diabetics. Uh, that is the standpoint of Dan. That's the standpoint of most training agencies, well, I, all training agencies. Um, it doesn't mean it can't be done, but from a legal perspective, that is what they have to, uh, that's, that's what they have to say, right? Wash your hands of it and, and say no diabetics in the overhead. Uh, because these, these risk factors, you can't mitigate them down to zero. You can mitigate them down to very, very small, but not zero. Um, there were diabetics in the comment section of that post all asking questions. Hey, I want to be cave trained. Why can't I dive? Um, those people I provided my diabetes brief to, my management plan to. So, all you know, while saying that you know this this works for me and this is still evolving for me, uh, but giving people a starting point, um, or if you just want to see it out of curiosity, then then certainly I'm, I'm more than happy to open source this. And, and just for the record, for anybody watching, if if this is a boat that you're in, feel free to reach out to me, and I'm happy to work with you as well and figure out if we can come up with a plan that works best for you. Um, all in all, there were how many attempts at full cave? Three. Three. On the third attempt, the skills finally got there, and then what happened? Yeah, we. Um, I passed full cave on uh, October 31st of 2022. I did not receive a full cave card until halfway through January of 2023. Why? because you and I made a pact when we began this journey that I was not getting a full cave card until the diabetes plan was 100% in place, functional, and tested in water. Um, at that point, the entire plan had been put in place, everything tested in water except for one piece. Um, there was one item, which we'll discuss coming up, uh, that I was waiting on insurance to fill. Um, it was a, a hard thing to get, and so we were waiting on the insurance to clear them and get them sent over to the pharmacy. It took a couple of months to get it done, uh, but Dean would not card me to full cave until we saw that this auto injector pen worked underwater. Uh, it's a mechanical pen. So we needed to verify that it wouldn't crack under pressure, that the mechanism would work, that it would punch through a dry suit. Um, so at Peacock on the peanut line again, we uh, went down with a four millimeter wetsuit wrapped around a sausage and we injected it and at that point i passed full cave officially uh that's, that's well wait, just to clarify it has nothing to do with him stabbing a sausage with a needle 
Yeah. So, so he, he completely completed all the skills to my satisfaction, which um, I have some fairly high standards as far as skills are concerned. Boy, do you. <laughs> um, but I wanted to know for not only my own well-being, but also for Zach and, and his well-being for the rest of his life, that the steps he were taking, obviously we can't guarantee that every dive we go into, we come out of, right? Agreed. But if it, if it wasn't me to train Zach, it might have been someone else who, would, who, who may or may not have put up the same effort, who may or may not have honestly made Zach jump through the, hill, uh, the, the hoops that I made him jump through because just having a briefing is one thing. Hey, I've got diabetes. You want to die with me? Great, let's go. It, it's not all about that. It's about having the proper mechanical steps and being able to execute said mechanical steps while experiencing an oncoming low blood sugar to successfully recover yourself almost all the time. Again, I can't guarantee it's always going to work, but the steps we have in place, I am very confident that Zach is going to always be able to come out of a cave, barring any outside catastrophes like a breakdown or something like that. Yeah. But just as far as low blood sugar, here's his steps. We start with the pre-dive briefing which has several phases. Hey, you still okay with diving with me? Cool, let's continue. Blah, 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 at blah, At multiple hey, you still points. Okay? Right, there's at least what, four or five? Four or five, yeah, five four checks five all points. said. Each little paragraph gets a little bit more eerie or scary or... Realistic. Really, yeah, well, so of course it's realistic. But we bring the realities out, we bring the management steps and what may be required. Um, and the last one is is very doom and gloom. You know, when you when you're telling somebody that I have a condition that, in the absolute worst case, may require you to leave me behind and clip me to the line. If you are not comfortable doing that, you should not be forced into doing that. You cannot be forced into doing that, and I'll sit the dive out. Um, you know, we have a lot of steps in place to make sure it never gets close to that. But it is if we chase the rabbit far enough. Um, it ends in bad places um, as you know if you ran any rabbit hole in cave diving I'm, I'm sure you could find the same end somehow some way um, but for my added risk factor yeah that that is a reality um, so the actual physical steps outside of the briefing um, the day of diving uh, I will intentionally run a high blood sugar um, obviously that's not recommended uh, for a diabetic right you should be in in perfectly controlled range um, but the reason, the, the why behind, behind the what, um, in the event that I have a low blood sugar in the water um, and I have a drop rate that is tanking my blood sugar, I don't want to have a drop rate that's extreme beginning at the floor, if you will. Um, so let's say below a certain number is when I start experiencing symptoms and I have a horrendous drop rate. Now I'm dropping deep, deep, deep into that zone where I'm starting to get incapacitated, where I'm, I'm mentally strained and uh, all of these things. So I want plenty of padding. So I'll go uh, pretty high up um, to give myself plenty of room to account for that, for if that drop were to ever happen. Um, generally that, that doesn't happen. Um, I, I won't take insulin before a dive. Um, just because knowing that that insulin is going to artificially drop my blood sugar. So I'm starting high. I won't enter the water without, uh, or with insulin on board within two to four hours. Uh, so that gives me plenty of padding to begin with. Um, for those that are completely unfamiliar with diabetes, uh, the side effects of a high blood sugar versus a low blood sugar. Now this is individual, right? Uh, this will change for every person you talk to, but for me, the high blood sugar results in pretty much a headache, a dry mouth, and uh, having to pee a little more often. Um, pee valve. Yeah, pee valve. <laughs> um, and even then, but if if the blood sugar is not outrageously high, you know, to, to where I, I usually keep it in the range where I won't even feel the headache, uh, but maybe I will urinate a little more often. Um, some people may find high blood sugars that, that I think are normal to enter the water with debilitating. Um, but again, individual basis. So for me, I will enter with enough padding. Um, Keep in mind, we're not going to talk about numbers or anything because those are numbers that apply to only Zach because we only know about Zach. Yep. Um, so 
Second thing, um, we've tried this in, in multiple ways and I've bricked multiple monitors trying this. Um, but my doctor recommended that in the same way that on open circuit, we know what our status of our gas is at all times, um, we should know the status of my blood sugar at all times. I wear a continuous glucose monitor on the surface. Um, so we tried building a window into my dry suit and putting a, yeah, putting the, the monitor into my, into my shoulder up here so that I could read my blood sugar out. Uh, I destroyed several monitors that way from the window flooding or the bags. That, yeah, and a dry suit that way. Um, next up, um, I think we're going to try a, a small Pelican case that's meant for cell phones. So that's actually in the mail coming this way. Um, the idea is active monitoring is the ultimate goal. To, to know the status of my blood sugar at any point during the dive without... And after 20 years, I don't want to say guesswork. I'm, I'm pretty good about knowing where my blood sugar is just based off of sensations in my body. Um, so thirst and headache will tell me how above normal my blood sugar is um, to within about 50 points. And as I start dropping, then I can actually feel down to within about 10 points how low the blood sugar is. Um, but again, those are reactionary measures. Those, those symptoms develop once I'm at a certain blood sugar. The monitor lets me see trends. So if I see that my blood sugar has been linear decreasing across the entire dive, I could preempt a low blood sugar from ever happening by just hitting the camelback um, that is still built into my K2 um, and bringing that back up. And I'll be able to see the effect of the sugar going on board. Um, so that's the absolute ideal case is to have active monitoring so that we can preempt events before they happen. Don't, don't you have two camelbacks as a redundant one? Yes, we'll, we'll get into that. I have, I have one on me and, and one staged. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. That's part of gas planning and things. Um, so, so diving as if, as you're that, swimming in, Right, every hundred feet you're taking a couple swings, right? Just to no, help. not not anymore. That no? was okay. That that was a plan that was developed around let's go in on a normal blood sugar and replace what I'm losing um, so using plan metabolic. Two point seven, right? Yeah, <laughs> we're on like twelve yeah, now or something like that. Rev sixteen. Who know? Who even knows? <laughs> um, but yeah, so now I, I enter the water and I expect that I should leave the water with a slightly lower blood sugar, but still plenty above above normal. Um, even once active monitoring is implemented in a, in a functional form uh, where I can see my blood sugar through my monitor across the entire dive, I would still enter the water with a high blood sugar uh, just because that padding is so important. Um, what actually happened inside of Twin Cave uh, during the inciting event for all of this was I never had a low blood sugar. Um, I just had a drop rate that I haven't experienced in a long time. I, I took insulin early that morning um, and that insulin failed to absorb properly that morning and it dumped into me as soon as we started physical activity. And so I had a sharp, sharp drop rate and drop rates can feel just like a low blood sugar. Um, so my blood sugar never actually got into the region that would be considered low. I was still in the controlled region, uh, but just the drop rate was felt enough like a low blood sugar and took me out of my cave diving mind state and into disoriented, I'm not feeling good mind state. Um, so I want plenty of padding in case that were to ever happen again. And again, that, that right there, that insulin absorption coming in late uh, is part of the reason why I will not take insulin prior to diving anymore, um, just in case it doesn't work properly. And for anybody that's had diabetes for an extended period of time, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, there's really no telling your body does weird, weird things. So that's that active monitoring. Um, that's TBD. We're still working on that plans ever evolving. Um, next up, uh, let's cut to the side camera our B roll, um, because I'm going to show what our other mitigation measures look like. Um, so for other mitigation measures, uh, there are in the now, event, th this is after the padding in the beginning doesn't end up being enough. The camelback doesn't end up being enough. You still end up feeling like you're going low, right? Yep. What's your next step? Or so either we lose the camelback or the camelback is insufficient. These are splits on the flow chart that we can turn to here. Um, so to B roll. Um, so 
Much in the same way that runners will have uh, sealed glucose gel pouches, I carry about 12 to 14 of these uh, on my person. Uh, these are individually sealed and these are redundant in the event of the camelback being punctured and losing all of the fluid or let's say a kink in the hose that I didn't catch, although I checked that before every dive. Um, so let's say for whatever reason, the camelback becomes non-functional. I carry enough of these to get out of the cave from deep, deep back. Um, one of these will recover a low blood sugar. Two of these will recover a really bad low blood sugar. So I carry enough to recover myself from six or seven really bad low blood sugars on the way out of the cave. Um, they are spaced around my kit uh, in every pocket that a dive buddy could open. So right side dry suit pocket, left side dry suit pocket, and both um, pockets of the tech bag that drags behind me. Um, the nice. reason... Floats. Floats, <laughs> drags, <laughs> sure. Um, the tech bag that, that's clipped off to one of my drop rings. Um, the reason for that, uh, in an emergency situation, if I need to access any of them, and let's say one hand is restrained or tangled or, or something to that effect, uh, my other hand needs to be able to access these pouches. And the second thing is when a buddy is under stress and attempting to aid you, you wanna make it as easy as possible for them to aid you. Uh, so in the pre-dive briefing, as opposed to saying, well, go digging into my right side pocket and then you'll find the glucose. No, open any pocket you want and you will find them. Just pass it up to me, right? Um, these are super, super simple to deploy. It's rip the top off, uh, this little flap up here, and then you just squeeze this pouch out. Is it a liquid or a paste? It's or? it's a gel. Um, okay. So the, the packet won't flood. And, and even if it does get a little bit of water in it, um, it's just going to slightly dilute it. But you're still getting the same dose. It's not a liquid that's going to float out into the uh, into the cave and, and you're going to lose the, the amount of glucose. You will always be delivered your 15 grams of fast-acting glucose. Um, so these... In the event that the camelback is gone, uh, that's what those are for, but these can also be used to supplement the camelback. So let's say it's it's bad enough that I chew through three, three liters of uh, super sugar, sugary substance like a lemonade or a, a decarbonated soda, something like that. Um, we've got the exact same amount duplicated um, in different places across my kit. Uh, now, the other thing that you see hanging out down here uh, this is the absolute last line of defense, and this is what we shot into the sausage over at Peacock uh, to prove that they work. Uh, this is called glucagon, and glucagon is a compound naturally produced in the liver. So the pancreas will produce insulin to drop the blood sugar, and the liver will produce glucagon to raise the blood sugar, and that's in a normally functioning person. Um, so we have a glucagon auto-injector pen. This works exactly like an EpiPen. Uh, where you press it down to skin and it will deliver a dose. Um, these things will recover you from a catastrophic low blood sugar in a matter of two to five minutes. Um, I carry three of these on my kit. Um, I brief their locations. Uh, the easiest one for my buddies to reach is in the outer pocket of my tech bag, but also both dry suit pockets, any pocket you can open. Um, we brief before the dive how to use them, uh, but again, a buddy under stress you want to make it as easy as possible. So I found a brand that actually has picture instructions um, on the outside case. The only added instruction I give is that bolt snap side down uh, because the pen is actually inside a sheath. Uh, but even then, I have some tape around the pen that keeps it from coming out of the cap so that if it were opened down, that pen is not falling out and getting dropped into the cave and falling down into a breakdown pile somewhere. Let's say the buddy drops the sheath. There are still pictures printed on the pen of how to use it. Um, and it is horrendously simple, as a matter of fact. It is literally pull the pen out and you will see yellow and press down to skin until you see red in this window. And that tells you that the dose is delivered. Um, these, I can deploy them myself. Buddies can deploy them in the event that uh, I was completely incapacitated. Um, and this is the absolute last line of defense. Um, I have not had an incident since that required this. I've only had one incident since the, uh, the twin event. And that one I was able to fix with a camelback. Uh, just sat against the roof for two minutes, drinking some uh, fluids out of the camelback and turned for home. Um, so let's go back to main camera and away from B-roll. And we can 
talk through the rest of this. Um, so we haven't so, tested the pen on you yet. We've tested we, the Camelback, right? Yes, yeah, so we've, we've tested the Camelback. We've tested the glucose pouches. We tested the pen's ability to puncture uh, thick neoprene and go and deliver the dose into that sausage. Uh, we verified that the actual plastic wrapping on the sausage was punctured because we smelled that it was one of those hot sausages. So we smelled the vinegar stuff coming out of it. Um, and I was actually able to find the puncture mark on the sausage. Um, and again, when you see red on that window, it means that the dose has been delivered. So we know that functions. The only reason we haven't jabbed me with it is because there hasn't been a low blood sugar that uh, required that. Um, Nor are we crazy enough to go in with an intentional low blood sugar in an overhead environment just to test the theory. Exactly. So. Um, but the mechanics of the emergency pens are there. Um, since we're taking those into the water, um, into an environment that they're not supposed to be, um, those are to be rotated every three months. So I'll remove the bolt snaps from them and I'll get another set and put them in just so that the internal springs don't rust, just so that repeated pressure cycling on the capsule holding the medication doesn't crack it and we don't lose it. Um, and I do inspect them just like I inspect the Camelback for kinks and uh, check on the pouches for punctures. I'll inspect those before every dive to make sure that they're functional. Um, that's that. Now, for the way the plan was developed, um, this entire plan was developed in the context of open circuit, uh, which right now is my absolute worst case. Um, I recently started diving CCR. I've been a CCR diver for about five months now. Um, so back in the day, when we drew up this plan, we drew this plan as I am on a ticking clock which in the event of a complete unit failure and a bailout, I am still on a ticking clock. Um, this is where we get into padding and staging and all of these extra things. Um, I think we can have our editor throw it up on the screen, um, but we'll see in a plan that I recently worked up, I have about 25 minutes of uh, time padding and almost 2000 feet of distance padding in extra gas just in the event that I needed to work a problem in place and the distance padding is, let's say I needed to take a crazy roundabout way out of the cave. Um, that one has less to do with diabetes. The 25 minutes of time padding, that has everything to do with diabetes. If I need to sit in place and work a problem instead of working it on the move uh, because it's bad enough, then I want plenty of time padding built into my plan. Uh, and these padding factors are already built on top of the fact that I pad my RMV, the fact that I assume the deepest depth of the cave is the entire extent of the cave. Um, I'll multiply all gas required to exit the cave with those factors times 1.5. And, and this is where we get insane safety factors on time and distance. Um, I have- You guys should see the Excel spreadsheets this guy builds. That's what I'm saying. I think I think we should flash them just to show it, but it's crazy. don't- we, we, don't... we can put up- a, a sample one. Please don't use those numbers. We might even blow them, blur them out as far as the numbers yeah. or maybe even a blank sheet just to see what kind of numbers he's crunching to get to the safety margin he feels he has. Yeah. So I, I use Excel and I've done it with formulas and um, conditional formats so that certain cells will turn certain colors when certain conditions are met. Um, so I will not dive the plan if I don't have an overall safety factor on gas of at least 1.5. Um, I will not dive the plan if I don't have an overall safety factor on uh, distance and time of 1.25. Uh, so I have 50% more gas than I need in an exaggerated situation. And I have 25% more time and extra distance to swim um, than I need. And, and that's, that's assuming open circuit bailout on your rebreather. That's assuming that, that I have a full unit failure. Right. Um, in actuality, what you know, there and anybody that dives CCR knows that there are a lot of steps in, in most cases between uh, a problem and, and completely leaving the loop. There's only two or three things that will push us completely off, um, but we won't discuss that here. That's uh, for your CCR instructors to tell you about. Um, but for me, what this practically looks like is that back in the day, we used to run the plan as we had steps in place that were, we're going to work this problem as we exit the cave, everything's going to be left in place. And, you know, in an absolute worst case scenario, yes, that I, I would execute that. But nowadays, if I'm on a functioning rebreather and I'm a ways back into the cave 
and I will give a real example. Um, this is the single event that has happened since we've began reworking this plan. This occurred just past Kings Canyon, so let's say about 1800 um, into Jackson Blue, and I felt a low blood sugar coming on. So what do I do? Um, I, and I wasn't there, you were solo, right? Yes, I was solo on this okay. dive. Um, so first of all, let's make a comparison back to Twin. Twin, I had no plan and I became very, very nervous uh, because it was my first low blood sugar in a cave and it became very apparent that I didn't have a plan. Um, so is this camelback gonna work? Am I gonna be able to recover this? Am I gonna be able to swim out of this cave? I, I didn't know those things back then. This time, I feel a low blood sugar coming on. Okay, <laughs> let's execute the protocol. Uh, no panic, no concern. I'm getting out of this cave because my plans are padded and I have systems in place and all I have to do is execute. So much in the same way that if something were to go wrong and we execute cave skills, something goes wrong, I execute my diabetes skills, which now are foundational cave skills. Um, so I pinned myself to the roof just so that I didn't have to worry about buoyancy or moving or knocking into things. So I found a nice flat spot, pinned myself to the roof, um, and I left the loop. I need to leave the loop because I'm gonna be switching back and forth between a regulator and a hose, and I can't flood my unit. Uh, uh, let's clarify, the hose is from the camel back to take sips. Yes, not, yes. Not so a, I'll, be, breathing hose. I'll be swapping back and forth between an open circuit regulator and a camel back hose um, to take sips. Can't do that by shutting the loop and opening the loop and shutting the loop and, and all of this. That would be inherently um, more dangerous. Yes, because I could flood my unit and now we are in an open circuit bailout situation. Um, so pin myself to the roof, calmly, slowly, in a manner as not to threaten flooding the unit or having anything else go wrong, leave the loop, get my short hose in. Okay, fantastic. Second of all, unclip the long hose and let that dangle right in front of me just in case I fumble the short hose or something goes wrong. I have a second reg that I can reach and grab quickly. And step three, now we start swapping. And I intake significantly more uh, sugar than I thought would be required to exit the cave because I knew that as I start exiting at 1800, I've got 26 minutes of swimming on the way out of the cave minimum, um, plus a decompression stop to execute. So I have time that I need to uh, account for here and I'm gonna be burning um, through glucose in my system uh, across this dive. So load on more than I need and if I need to stop on the way out, then we'll stop on the way out. Um, so once that's done, sit in place for two minutes after I get back on my loop and tuck my long hose back so that all of my dangles are sorted and my kit is back in one functional piece. Um, sit there for two minutes because I have the time to burn on CCR. Uh, if this were an open circuit bailout, I'd be getting out of there immediately. Uh, but I sat there just to recover my mental state and say, okay, you're fine. Everything's cool. Let's let the shakes dissipate for a second and then turn for home and swim. Um, so I turned for home, I swam, uh, and that, that situation ended well. Um, I'm not happy that I had a low blood sugar inside the cave. Um, but I am somewhat relieved that it happened because it allowed me to relive the same experience as twin, but now with the management plan in place and see what it did to my mental state and actually test the protocols that we've been working on for a year now. Now, ideally it wouldn't have happened solo. But the fact that it did happen solo. But it did solo and, yes. and, and you were fine. Yes. And so here's a perfect example. It's safe to say that you now dive, dive as, as if. if. On every dive, you're gonna have a low blood sugar. Yep. Dive as if. So to Dean's point uh, earlier when he mentioned a redundant camelback, uh, we were working for a long time in our plan to try and figure out how we were gonna squeeze two camelbacks into this, into my K2. Um, it got ridiculous, man. Like there's not a lot of space to squeeze three liters of fluid into this K2. Um, but we tried, uh, just in case I lost one, I would have an extra and it'd be an extra safety layer uh, between Redundancy. Yeah, between having to go to the gel packets or the emergency pens. Um, that didn't, it, it didn't end up working, I tried it. Um, but what I do now is, since I'm on CCR and I'm executing larger penetration dives, um, on my safety bottles, um, right now one of them in the middle of the cave has a camelback, but ideally at some point it, it would probably behoove me to have a camelback on every single safety bottle 
That's overkill, but it's also diving as if because what if my stage camelback is now torn? Um, so I have a bottle on stage rocket 2500 and that one on the exterior of the bottle has a, uh, a Kevlar bag that the camelback sits inside. Um, so in the event that I'm further back than that and, and I need more glucose than I have on me on the way out, um, let's say I, I don't wanna use my gel packets. Well, I get to my bottle and either clip it off in an open circuit situation and now I have my hose or just pick the camel back up and go if I'm on a, on a rebreather situation and then start working it on exit or work it in place. Um, the idea is we've created a protocol where there are options. There's the same way that you need options to solve problems in a, in a cave problem, we have options to solve the diabetes problem. Um, CCR has afforded me a lot more options and a lot more time, time. to work problems, which is, uh, fantastic and probably the most important um open circuit on uh, with a low blood sugar it, it does become a ticking clock and it becomes a bit of a concern um so having the ccr as a buffer is uh definitely great but even then we have protocols for that what happens if you have a low blood sugar that's bad enough that you're impaired uh, if you're mentally impaired on a ccr well that can be very detrimental do you know your po2 are you is your gas breathable if, if you're in a semi-closed yeah. scenario, can you properly keep breath count? Exactly. Lots of things come into play. So this is why I pad my open circuit plan so heavily. Um, what if I need to slow down? And what if I need to leave the loop, even if it's functional? If, if I'm degraded enough to the point that I don't feel that I can fly the breather anymore, I'm getting off the breather. Uh, that It's just not a question. Um, we need to go back to the absolute fundamentals of, I have a breathable gas in this tank. And as long as there's gas in the tank, I can breathe. And Which is why there's enough open circuit bailout because the last thing you want to have in a scenario like that is wondering, hey, if I, I know I really should bail out because I'm a little cloudy in the head. Do I have enough gas to make it out? If you've got a question that you don't have enough. Yeah. Uh, and enough gas to make it out in some people's plans might be far less padded and far less conservative than mine. I know that I can bail out at any point for any reason. If my stomach doesn't feel right, or if I have a headache, or if I'm just having a bad day and I'm done flying the CCR. If it's after six on Tuesday and you yeah, want a taco. That's <laughs> I can close the loop and I know I have more than enough gas and more than enough time and more than enough distance added into the plan to get out. Um, and all of this revolves around the fact that I'm diabetic. It takes extreme conservatism in planning and in execution to take diabetes into an overhead. That's something we didn't know back in twin. We were kind of flying by the seat of you our pants. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah, we, that is a valid statement, especially in scuba, actually in anything. But at that point, we definitely did not know what we did not know. And sir. we took that as a huge kick in the face to say, hey, it's time to like get real and do this the right way because trying to fly by the seat of your pants in cave diving is not a good way to be. Doesn't work. And I've never been that way, but. I didn't know anything about diabetes, so that was a, a big eye opener for me, thankfully. For the diabetics, and I guess just even for the general listeners, uh, there is a disconnect when it comes to bringing medical issues into diving, in any form, even, even open water diving. Um, so for me, as a diabetic, I, I have a specialized doctor that deals with endocrine con conditions. They're called an endocrinologist. I mean. uh, yeah. So. Dean knows everything about cave diving and knew nothing about diabetes. My endocrinologist knew everything about diabetes, but nothing about cave diving. And so having me play middleman and trying to work that out while we were uh, building out this plant, that didn't work. So we just put them in contact. We had a FaceTime call while I was at the doctor and Dean sat there bouncing questions off of the endo. The endo was bouncing questions off of Dean. Um, these are all things that go so far beyond just having that endo sign the medical waiver saying, oh, okay, you say you're okay to dive, you're okay to dive. Which, which as an instructor, I would probably say with fair certainty that he probably signed that piece of paper because he had no idea what was involved in cave diving. That, certainly. So, and I looked at that, oh, he's diabetic, but the doctor signed it. I accepted it because I didn't know anything about diabetes. Yeah, and... Now we do. Well, un unfortunately, uh, that is probably the reality across the industry is that when your doctor clears you to dive, uh, they're doing it not 
fully understanding what it is that you're about to go into. Even in open water diving, there, there are risks as a diabetic. Um, and your doctor may say, okay, you're fit to dive as long as you bring some glucose along with you. Uh, but have we chased the rabbit far enough in that one? Have, have we looked at all of the things can go wrong? Are we diving as if? Um, your, your doctor's not. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. I, I will add that um, in the very beginning, every time Zach and I got together or even talked on the phone, like I, I would hear him talking about something or, or you know, showing somebody this, some, and, and I'm like, well, hey, how about this? And I'd pose a question to him, and he was like, well, I don't know. I never thought of that. I don't know. I never thought of that. I don't know. I never thought of that. I got to tell you, it was just, what, maybe a month ago, the very first time that one of my questions to Zach, wait, hey, how about this? He actually had an answer. So it's not only, I'm not only teaching him how to, or we're not only learning how for him to deal with this, but it's also changing his thought process. If this, then what? If that, then what? It's growing the, growing the skill set is one thing. Growing the mindset is a a totally totally different thing. And Dean's right, yeah, for for a long time. He would present questions that I didn't have answers to. Now, mind you, I would go turn around and and get very detailed answers to that, do any requisite math, do any planning, take it to the extreme and and chase it down. But lately, we've switched away from Dean posing the question and and me finding the answer to me posing the question to myself, having the answer, and I'm- Running it past me for like kind of an okay. Exactly. Yeah, which, which, is, which is huge, right? So in the beginning, he didn't know what he didn't know about cave diving. So how does he know how to deal with diabetes in cave diving? Well, if I do this in a cave while I'm having a low blood sugar, like how is that going to affect me? What am I going to do? How am I going to be able to, you know? So it, it has definitely been a huge learning experience for both of us. Hopefully the first episode and, and now this video will, um, hopefully it won't be a huge learning experience for any of you, but it'll be enough to spark your interest enough to find an instructor, find an endocrinologist. If you're interested, come up with your own plan because this plan, I would stay without a shadow of a doubt, will not work for anyone else other than Zach. That is the only thing I am comfortable saying. 100%. It might not even work for him all the time, but I can't say with any certainty that it's going to work for any of you ever. So please don't, like I said earlier, or as we said earlier, don't take this as Here's your dive plan. Yeah. Uh, the, the diabetics that I came in contact with through that Dan post about diabetes, that was the number one disclaimer was, I would love for you to benefit from the year of work that Dean and I have done and all of the questions posed to him, the doctor, and experiences had in CAVE, uh, but this plan should be your foundation and, and not your final, right? Use this, modify it as needed, talk to your doctor, talk to your instructor, um, and just work out every kink and every quirk of your condition. This, this shouldn't even just apply to diabetes. This, you know, although we're discussing exclusively diving with diabetes right now, this should be for any condition that's gonna increase your risk factor in the overhead. Anything, anything at all. So the, some people may be asking, why bother? Just, just why? Um, I can't answer that. That would be a question for Zach. Why, why bother going through all this just to see some wet rocks? Um, I, I can say with 100% certainty, if any of you have any questions as to what the, the, the sex appeal or the beauty of, of cave diving is, you, you probably haven't been cave diving. There are very few people that I know that have been in an overhead cave and it's either going to be one of two things. Oh, I'm never going to do that again. Or, oh my God, I don't ever want to not do that. I'm going to miss the rest of my life. People like us would live in an underground cave filled with water if we could. Unfortunately, we don't have gills. But So that's his why, because he got bit by the bug. So did I, which is why I teach. I have an alternate why as well. Okay, go ahead. Um, much as I love cave diving for cave diving, why diabetes in cave diving? Why jump the hoops? Why do all of this work? and why enjoy doing all of this work. Um, I was diagnosed with diabetes when I was five turning six. Um, It's been almost 18, 19 years now. I'm almost two decades of being a diabetic. Um, So it's basically governed much much of your life that you can remember. It's, yeah, for, for as long as I can remember, I've been diabetic. And there is one thing that I remember 
so clearly about right when I was diagnosed in, in the years following, in the months, in the days following, um, my mother would repeat religiously to me, this is not going to stop you from doing anything. You're going to do whatever you want to do. This condition is not going to dictate your life. You're going to dictate the condition. Um, that's why I do what I do because nothing is going to stop. I will find a way to mitigate. I will find a way to push through. And if I want to do it, I will make it happen. So I wanted to cave dive and we found the way. It took a lot of work, it took a lot of extra hoops. And, and let, me, let me interrupt you now because I'm going to tell you now why I'm involved in this whole scenario. Because of that attitude. Because if he is so set that I am going to do this no matter what, no one's going to stop me. Listen, if someone's that set, they're going to go cave diving even if they don't have a cavern card. Nah, right? I don't know about all that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my philosophy is I, I would rather help Zach come up with these, with, with the um, most probable type scenario where Zach goes in and comes out of every cave dive in his future then turn him away and have him do it with maybe an instructor that doesn't take the time to get to know his endocrinologist and, and get on a Zoom call and discuss the back and forths. Maybe an instructor who, who doesn't spend extra dives and extra days without even charging him extra because I, 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 I need to, I, I have to. I can't just say, hey, you know what? Sorry, I don't want to be involved. It's just, it's not worth it. It is worth it because Zach's life is worth it. And if one thing that I've done can make it a little bit better for Zach, a little bit more likely for him to come home from every dive, then for me, it's worth it. And I've, I've got to say at, at its core, right? Some people may be thinking that Dean's doing this because he doesn't want to put his name on a card of a student that's a liability. And, and while that may be true, I'm right? covered. Well, while that may be true, he's, he's covered in every regard. Um, the reason that we've become such good friends is because it was immediately apparent that this was far more than cover your ass. This was a genuine care and concern for, we're gonna make this work. I would do it for and, anybody. Not to say yeah. I would become good friends with just anybody, but I would do this with any student that asked me to. Yeah, so, well, let me thank you on camera. Thank you, Dean, it's been- It's my pleasure. And having you as a friend a heck of is a ride. even more of a pleasure. Thank you, appreciate that. Anyhow, now that we've talked your ears off, and um, <laughs> you're probably sick of looking at us, because. We're not attractive. That's okay. Anyway. Um, Speak for yourself. We, we hope we've covered a, a fair bit more. It's probably still going to be an involving scenario for Zach and his cave diving endeavors. Um, we'll probably do another episode to display and demonstrate and show you how that monitor will work once we get a Pelican case that it'll work in. Yep. Um, but he's flooded enough devices already, so we got to work on getting a case for it. <laughs> so, anyway. We hope this helps. We hope this is informative and helps you guys start to ask your own questions if you're diabetic and, and are considering getting into even open water diving or overhead diving or wreck diving, whatever it may be. If you have any questions, ask in the comments below, reach out, Facebook, call, whatever it may be. Um, I'm Dean Olmschneider with Scuba Techie. And I'm Zach Israel. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Into, into the, the Overhead. Head. Don't forget to dive as if. <laughs>